nesting, pesting, vesting, all sorts of testing until Twitch says I'm live. Twitch says I'm live. Welcome to the stream. Um, we're going to pretty much continue from last time, and um, by which I mean we're not going to continue from last time, and I need to update this. Uh, we're going to continue from last time, and last time we, uh, we got as far as uh, giving how far two objects were separated in terms of edge-to-edge -edge angular distance from a given observer. Um, so now what we're ready to do is we're ready to create a function uh, that tells us, so we're sort of ready to combine all the steps we had earlier. Uh, so we're going to say given um, a, a viewing object, a viewing planet, uh, a light generating planet, the sun is usually the, you know, if we're using planet in the more generic sense of the word, and an obscuring object, the thing that is trying to cause the eclipse. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the uh, sort of uh, maximum, we're going to check the, um, let's see if we can bring this up here, we're going to check the, uh, the, the occlusion uh, at, you know, both here and here, both uh, both at, at both points that are for th that are perpendicular to where the sun is, the light generating object is, uh, and are right at the edge of the object Q, in other words, on the surface of the object Q. And as we spoke earlier, um, if this point here and this point here are both eclipsed, then just because of the way the umbral cone works, the whole light side of the planet is eclipsed. And obviously, if the whole light side of the planet is eclipsed, that includes the two points uh, that are here and here. So it is sufficient to check for those two points. Um, and because we want to use the geometric finder, we want to get sort of a, a degree of how eclipsed uh, something is. We have created this function separation data, which for a given point, doesn't even have to be an object, a given point uh, tells whether or not the, um, the, you know, the two bodies are touching, which means there's a partial eclipse, or one completely eclipses the other, in which case there's a total eclipse. Unfortunately, it's possible for there to be a partial eclipse with neither of these two points partially eclipsed. So this will not work for partial eclipses. This will only work for total eclipses. Um, but that, that should be fairly interesting. Um, so let's go ahead and write a function now. Separation data, the perpendicular vector. Wow, we've got all sorts of good stuff here. Um, so now we're actually ready to write our function that takes three objects, three planets or whatever it is, um, and, and makes a determination of whether, uh, you know, T is completely, T is completely eclipsing S as U from the corners of Q. Um, or to what extent that, that, um, that eclipse is occurring. And again, we're going to use the maximum value because the lower the value, the greater the eclipse. And we want to see the least eclipse because it's only, uh, it's only going to be a total eclipse if both of the numbers are below minus one. Um, so let's call this, and let's be careful how we do this, because now we're going to send in actual, actual positions, uh, and we don't have to sort of, um, we don't have to sort of use, uh, yeah, well, uh, we will have to use points because we will, uh, we are obviously, um, we're obviously, uh, uh, because we want to, we want to take it on the two surface points of Q, which are not, um, which are not, some, which is not something C spice can uh, return directly. I mean, it might actually be able to do that, but that's we've created our own routine called the per perpendicular vector to do that. So let's go ahead and say I'm going to copy these comments, but I'm obviously not going to. Um, obviously, we're going to change them a little bit. Given three plan, uh, given three objects. Well, you know what, I think we can actually do this because we a earlier had something called a light generating object. Um, given the following, so I think we can use either of these actually. Uh, except we're given one more thing. A light generating object S, the radius of S. Now, of course, because we're being given the object, um, we could in fact compute its body, its, its radius, uh, from, you know, using BOD VRD or whatever. And I'm actually now beginning to think that we should, um, we should do that. So let's see. A light generating object is a body name. Uh, another object, T, has a body name. Um, light generating, okay. 
I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say an object T, Jupiter has a body name, and an object Q, e.g. Io. I'm going to say I'm going to say Io, even though that's really not the best name because it looks like a one zero. Um, an eclipsing object. So not okay. Good. This will be an eclipsing object T, an eclipsed body. I should probably say object Q has a body name. Returns the um, minimum eclipse. This is going to be careful here. As measured by separation data of the two points on Q that are perpendicular um, to the vector QS. Um, that is what it returns. I was worried briefly that uh, calling BOD VRD would be unnecessary or excessive, uh, but I think it's a pretty fast subroutine. Um, and this does help because I'm not sure in, in other programs, not the one we're using right now, we might not call BODVRD outside of this routine. So it, it is useful to call it here. Okay. Um, if the return value is less than minus, less than or equal to minus one, the entire, all of Q is eclipsed. Is eclipsed from S by T. That sounds pretty good. And this time, because we're returning a single value, we can say spice double. Um, max corner eclipse. You got to be a little bit careful uh, because it's theoretically possible you have more of an eclipse somewhere else, although it's not relevant to us. Um, so we will have um, spice char star. Let me be a little bit careful here to see if we want integers or if we want, um, it doesn't really matter, but um, just because I want to be consistent on what we did before. Um, I think we want uh, NAIF IDs here. So I, I'm pretty sure obscuring ID is a, um, is a, um, is an integer. And it is. So I'm going to be a little bit more careful here and say, as a naif ID, as a naif ID, as a naif ID. And I hope I don't run into the same problem where I have to convert between naif IDs and strings. I think, I think I can avoid it. Um, so this will be, um, a string is just a spice char. Uh, something tells me that I'm doing something wrong here, but um, no, actually, this probably is okay. That is what a, that is what a string is. It is a pointer to a uh, character in 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 C because it's really an array. Oh, cont spice. Oh, do I care? I think I'm going to leave it as spice char, even though we're not going to change it. it. It is a constant. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to determine. I guess well, there's two things we need to do: determine the radiuses of all three of these and then determine the vector that goes uh, from uh, Q to, uh, uh, yeah, the vector that goes from Q to the R and S. But let's see if we need to do bod verd first. Um, okay, and the observer here is, have I, yes, it is a char. So I think we can get away with, um, I think there's a function that'll let us do it directly from, um, directly from the naif ID. I don't think we need to go through bod word. From the return DP, bod VCD is probably what we're looking for. Uh, yes, here it is. So it's the same function, but it just, uh, it just uh, uses naif IDs instead of strings. So let's go ahead and paste the definition of it here, the signature of it here, so we can use it. Um, we already have the three body IDs. Oh, and then of course these will all be, um, these will all be integers. Not even pointer to integers, real actual integers. I'm very excited about that. Okay, so we have three integers. Um, body item, the item, that's going to be the rate A, which we can put in as hard coded. The max N, which we will need just because 
we don't necessarily know um, how many uh, variables we're getting back. And then we do actually need, um, because the rate i are three in, um, because they're actually vectors, and we we're only going to use the first one, but still. Uh, so we'll say, um, did I actually say STNQ? That sounds a lot better. And it would be nice if I made the third one also an int, not a pointer to an int. Okay, so it's going to be SR3 SR because we need TR3 and QR3. Again, we're not going to use all of these, but but we do need them. Uh, and then we're also, ooh, i got to be careful here. Um, yeah, I was going to create variables just to hold the very first value of SR3, STR3, and QR3, but I don't think that's, we can just say SR0 where we need it, hopefully. All right, so we want BODVIDS uh, ECDC. Um, body ID is S, rate I, uh, the address of N, we don't even really care what it returns, uh, spice int star dimension. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I might have messed something up. Um, oh, max n is the max number of values. It's, we're going to get three, basically. That's going to give us back the dimension, and what we actually want, of course, are the values. Uh, so this will be SR, and again, if I were being really clever, uh, we could um, we could uh, put a loop around this or something to make it a little bit a little bit smarter. Okay, so we have now the radii of the three objects. Well, I'm going to use the first one, which is the uh, which is the zero index. Uh, of the uh, of each radii, and so now what we want, we're basically going to do the same thing we do here in BC obscurations, uh, but only only a little part of it, um, and then we're going to say what is the um, let's see what do we need here, per vector, separation data, let's see, radius. So we have two objects and then a um, oh. Yes, and and these are the uh, that's right. These are from, um, well, the first one's going to be from. Well, actually, we don't need to do one from Q. We we could, um, and we might just for fun. Uh, but the uh, the first one. The f so the first thing we need to get is the perpendicular vector uh, from from. Let's see, spice double P three. Okay, so we need the perpendicular vector going from. Uh, Q, which we're assuming is our zero point, because the middle of Q is our zero point. Uh, so let's go ahead and get that perpendicular vector. Ooh, that's not what I meant to do. Kind of clever, though. Uh, and that's going to be um, perp vector is going to be QR, which is going to be QR zero in our case. Uh, spice double the position to S, which is just S, which we haven't determined yet, so this isn't going to work. So <laughs> let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and add some comments to this, huh? Do that of all three objects. And maybe I should have been adding more comments as we go along. Um, and I, I'm kind of bad about that when I'm programming in a language I don't like, such as C. But, but let's go ahead and do it anyway. Um, position from Q to R and uh, to S. Do we need the position? Well, we'll if we do, we do, we'll get it. Um, so the position is going to be and I think this is going to be spic easy p. This is why th most of these things have two versions. One is the version for um, one is the version for uh, for the ID naif ID, and the other one is the version for the the string. And again, that seems kind of silly because you could just convert between them. But hey, let's not complain about that. Okay, so the uh, the position of uh, s. And I guess we do need here um, an ephemeris time et uh, returns minimum clips at the minimum clips as measured by separation at time et of the two blah 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 blah. Guess we do need to actually put in a spice double et here. And some, I should make some sort of phone home joke here, but I'm not going to, because it's a pretty old movie, actually. 
All right, and I don't think it matters what, uh, as long as we're consistent, what um, what um, reference frame we use. C n plus s, just because we want to. Um, the observer ID here in this case is going to be Q. Um, and let's see. Oh, and the position is going to be the return value here. Uh, so that that, and then we need again the thing we don't care about, which is the light travel time, which we'll put here. So we'll put this as just pause three. And I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to need to we're going to need to find the position to t for some reason. Um, maybe not though. Oh, we will because when we pass it to um, separation data, it needs the position of t with respect to. Uh, so we'll call this s pause, and we'll have a t pause as well. Um, so that's a position that is from um, 2s as measured from q. Then we're going to get the position of t uh, as measured from q in the J2000 reference frame. Again, doesn't matter as long as we're consistent. And now, one of the bad things about new versions of Emacs, which is very, very minor, is when you um, when you bring up the switch buffers menu, it doesn't let you switch to the same buffer if you have a split window, the same buffer you're already in, even though that's really useful um, if you're looking at two different parts of a file, which is one of the one of the many advantages of using Emacs. Um, so we have perp vector qr zero. Um, you know what? Yeah, perp vector may not need it. I think separation data is going to need it, though. That's that's why we're doing this. Uh, perp vector s, and then we need um, place to hold it. And because of the weird way we get this thing returns things, it's almost going to be certain that um, that the third element of perp vector will be zero. That's just because when it's when it's possible for it to be zero. Um, that's just because of the way they do things. Okay, so now we have the perpendicular vector, and the perpendicular vector is of the correct length, qr. Uh, so now what we need to do is find the separation data. Um, and the separation data is unusual because I think it takes... No. No, it doesn't. Um, position. Um, oh, right, right. It takes... Um, the positions of two elements and returns the separation vector. So here's where we got to get a little bit clever, though, um, because what we want to send it is not the vectors of uh, the vectors we calculated s pause and uh, t pause. We actually want to uh, send it a um, the vector that is the addition of s pause with the perpendicular vector and the subtraction of uh, well, pff, okay. Instead of our viewing point being q, our viewing point will be either Q plus uh, the perpendicular vector, or Q minus the perpendicular vector. Those are going to be the two edge points. Um, so we can do. Be a little bit careful here because, in theory, we can actually use S pause. Um, we don't actually have to use S. We can use the same variable over and over again. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that though. Um, because we could just say here s pause, well, zero <laughs> plus equals um, the, um, and then we could just say the plus equals, and this is if we're going in the negative direction we add, and if we're going in the positive direction we subtract, because we're moving the, the the end point, and this could just be like perp zero, and then the next time we could do it is minus two perp zero, so we get back to the original position and go one more. Um, I'm not sure I'm happy about that. On the other hand, um, we don't really need to do a vector add here. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, it really, really doesn't matter. I'm just being maybe too clever here. So we're just going to say s pause north and south. I mean, it's not really north and south, but we're going to we're going to say that. Um, no, we're not. Okay. Compute the position f 
from the northern side of Q, southern side of Q, and it's not even, that's a totally bizarre thing to say, um, um, by adding perp vector to T, to S pause and T pause. Um, so it, we're actually moving south, but instead of us moving south, that which means the two vectors will move north uh, by that same amount. So this is going to be the vectors as measured from the southern side, and I'm going to be a little bit a little bit more than um, make a little tiny loop here. Um, Okay, so this moves both T and S, uh, you know, one radius higher, which is the way we would see it if we were one radius lower. Okay. Compute the position, and we're going to do some work between these. Q. By undoing first transformation, and then adding, and then subtracting perp vector from s pause and t pause. So probably not really a great idea, but uh, it, it should work. So the minus here is going to be times 2 because we have to get rid of the original transformation and then add another or subtract another one. Okay, so now here, I think this is where we can finally use separation data. And this is going to be, um, well, since we're calling these directions north and south, we might as well call these um, SEPN and SEPS. So they're not really north and south, though, but whatever. Um, SEPN equals um, and this should say, okay, Okay, because we're using higher numbers to mean less eclipsed, this max here is technically correct. Uh, but we're saying the minimum eclipsed, so let's just call this a min corner eclipse. Um, but it, we're returning the higher of the two values. So separation of n equals is going to equal separation data of the s pause vector which we've modified the sr0 which is the radius of s the t pause vector we've mo modified and the, uh, the the radius of of t and then we did the same thing over here and it's actually literally the same thing because we are using this we've modified the vectors okay so now um We are going to print them because I want to do a little bit of testing. But we're ultimately going to return the, um, and in fact, we'll just say this, return min sep n sep s. That is what we're going to return. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that is, yes, very nice. Okay. Um, so we want to be able to test this. Uh, the min corner eclipse. And we're still using obscurations as sort of, we're going we're gonna to write a new program for this. But we're still using obscurations as sort of our testing um, framework. So we're saying at the beginning and end of each eclipse, let's see if we can, um, um, at the beginning we should really not have a full eclipse. So let's see if we can do this here. Um, and we're just going to call, oh, do we want, we're just going to call it right now. Um, min corner eclipse, et will be big, um, spice and s, t, and q, and I, unfortunately I think we passed them as strings, which I probably need to fix when we do the corrected one, uh, but we do, conf uh, we do their IDs at some point too, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, here it is, c to c, bod to s, string to, string to, uh, they mean integer. Okay. And the order here is the ET, which we've gotten. S is the um, 
Hmm. Obscured. God damn, I hate myself. ID. Uh, obscure ring ID. Observer ID. And we don't need to print it because we have a debugging print statement in the, um, in the, uh, in the, uh, function itself. But... We are going to do this fake looking, um... Might as well just make the function name. Fake looking XML stuff uh, around it because I want to do all three of the values. Uh, bag, bag plus, you know, the, the middle one. And the middle one's probably where we're most likely to get a value less than negative one. And I think I'm okay with not putting a plus and minus one here. Uh, because we're looking at a floating point number, so we don't, it's not, a, it's not a binary. And then we can do this. And if this works, we're actually in pretty good shape to be writing a, a new program uh, that, uh, does, that doesn't use the occultation function because we found it's not strong enough for our purposes and, and does what we want. Um, let me quickly see if there's anyone ch you know, watching me. There is not good because it annoys me, uh, which is bad because I'm a Twitch streamer, which means I'm supposed to enjoy it. But whatever. Okay. Um, let's do a make, and I will make sure it actually gets made. <whistles> Whoa. Okay. That's because I was inside of something that was... <laughs> that w I had an S, uh, a secure shell uh, file system mount, but I killed it and rebuilt it, but that doesn't work uh, for if you're already in the directory that got killed. Okay. Passing argument for a bud from incompatible pointer type enabled by default. And is that because I want to pass... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not correct. Okay. Uh, S, R, T, R, Q, R. Those should be all fine. Um, okay, so it's what it's complaining about. In function moon corner eclipse, argument four. Okay, so argument four is an array of doubles. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah, because of course, um, n is an integer, not a double. Once more into the breach. Um. Spincent. That's a type I invented myself. But it doesn't work. Alright, let's see what's going on here. Passing argument to a perp vector makes pointer from integer without cast. Um, really? Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um, yes, I'm pretty sure I meant to say S pause here, not S. Okay, I think that's, this is of course, again, um, just terrible, terrible coding practice. Okay, wait, what? I'm pretty sure there's a min function in the math. Um, all right. I'm going to be surprised if there's a min function in, in C, C math. Um, oh, wow. They aren't. Of course they're not, because that would be too useful. Um, well, then I'm going to use my favorite operator that no one likes, which is... Um, I don't know how am I doing? Sep n, sep. If sep n is less than sep north, then we return. Um, we want to return. Oh, we actually want to return the higher of the two values, I think. Um, right, right. Because if they're, we want to return one that is less eclipsed, which is the higher. So that's actually kind of nice. If s, if sep n is greater than, then we return sep n. Otherwise, we return sep s. That's a horrible way of doing it, um, but. The fact that they don't bother to define min and max. Actually, you c I could define a min and max function on my own, and maybe I should. 
but then it would be a question of whether it's an array or uh, just two elements. All right, BC Obscuration is working, so let's run it. Oh, uh, let me... Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Um, so in the middle, it's a pretty decent 70 times, which is actually makes sense, because from Metis, wait, am I on Io? Well, even from Io, the, the Jupiter is much bigger than the Sun. So this actually does make sense. We have one side that is totally eclipsed at the beginning, when, this is when the central point is eclipsed, which is actually sort of ambiguous to us. Um, then we have a huge total eclipse in the middle, and then when it comes out of it, the other end is uh, the other end is still uh, fully eclipsed. Uh, so this actually does make sense. These results do make sense here, and we're seeing them repeatedly. Um, I want to see if we can get these with um, a total eclipse of the moon, which is actually so. It's going to be. I love the way I do the orders of these. Um, the observer will be the moon, the sun will be obscured, and it will be the earth doing the obscuration. So this gives us, um, yeah, the earth ha is, is bigger than the moon, but it's not, I mean, bigger than the sun, angular uh, width from the moon, but not that much bigger. So again, these numbers sort of make sense. Um, when, and again, the fact that we're hitting the middle point of the moon is actually kind of uninteresting. Uh, but that's what the occultation function gives us, so we kind of have to deal with it. Um, so let's see, Mincorn, Africa, blah, 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 test B, result, obscuring. Um, yeah. So this seems reasonable. Now, if I do this with, um, there's never a total, the, the entire Earth is never totally eclipsed by the moon. In other words, we, we never have a, a huge one of those. So we'll just flip the sun and the, nope, will we? Hang on. It's the viewing point is Earth, the sun is the light generating object moon. This should give us nothing. Um, in fact, I think if we go to 2020, there's one occurrence where this actually happens. Um, and you'll notice that, um, Right, there's a partial eclipse, partial eclipse, uh, partial eclipse. Uh, never a full, uh, par less than one is, is a partial eclipse. Um, it's kind of strange that they stay on one side of the Earth, but uh, I'll, I'll believe that for now. Um, and I guess there's never a total eclipse on... Um, th that actually shouldn't be true. We should be able to find something between years 2000 and 2020. Da 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 dun 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 Okay. Um Wow. Okay, here's a case where we do have a total eclipse somewhere on the Earth. Um and we could probably use this data here. See when that was. Uh, the December 4th of 2002, we're just going to say eclipses for 2000. I could have said um, solar eclipses. Oh, in fact, I will say solar eclipses. Solar eclipses for 2002. December 4th, total solar eclipse. So that is um, it's the only one, in fact. So it's pretty nice that we actually we, we managed to catch that right here with the negative number. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to... Um, we're not, BC Obscurations was written to use the occultation function that uh, CSpice has built in. Uh, we've now found a way to replace it, kind of. The one thing we still don't have is a way of determining whether there's a partial eclipse anywhere on the uh, surface of a given, of a given planet. Um, and I, I suspect what we could do is we could look at the, um, the you know, the, um, the separation data for every point well, we could we could we could plot the separation data for every point from the you know southernmost where the sun is rising to where the sun is setting, uh, and all points along that sort of um, circle, which is actually you know part of a sphere. 
and, and see, uh, look for the sort of minimum value there to see if there's any portion that has a total eclipse or even a partial eclipse. Um, however, I don't know what the function would look like, and w that's something we can find out actually, but uh, that'll be, let's actually put that on our uh, to-do list here. Um, look at um, eclipse curve from sunset to sunrise, see if easy to find um, min value max eclipse. So we're going to kind of start referring to the minimum value as the maximum eclipse, which it is. Okay, uh, but we can't do that right now. So right now the only thing we can do is hopefully predict when a total eclipse of the whole, you know, meaning that as viewed from, you know, a total eclipse meaning the whole planet is eclipsed, which means that when you view it from another planet, the planet that's blocking that, you have a total lunar eclipse, which is ultimately the question we're trying to answer here for Metis and for um, Io, Ganymede, uh, Callisto, and uh, Europa. Uh, and then in theory, we could answer it for other Jupiter moons that we know a little bit about. Uh, then we could compile it into a big, huge, fancy-looking answer. And then we could just, uh, you know, um, have a pizza made out of watermelon because you just never know. Um, so so let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to call this, and here's where it's going to get ugly. We have a BC obscurations and we have a BC eclipses. I'm going to call the third version of this, it's going to be so confusing. I'm going to make a copy of this and then trim because this, uh, this is going to be a lot easier. Um, I'm going to call this um, Okay, so it's still going to be correct. And I may, might just change these names to be something less stupid. Um, I'm going to call this uh, BC Occultations, unless I already have one of those. I don't. So this is good. I've got three different things that are that are very, very different. Um, and, but, I mean, they have very similar names, but they do slightly different things. It's very confusing, which is, again, one of the sort of meta goals of programming is to be confusing. Okay, so here I think we're going to say um, observer obscured object. Uh, so the observer is going to be the moon, not necessarily our moon. The obscured object is going to be the sun, and the obscure ring object is going to be a planet. So I'm getting tired of this sort of silliness. And I'm going to see if we can manage to do this with um, NAFE IDs solely. Um, and let's, let's kill these variables until we need them. And then um, and let's see. And I think we can do a better job here as well. And so Moon Sun Planet seems fairly generic, because, I mean, Moon doesn't really refer to Luna, which is our Moon. I mean, it can, but it doesn't have to. Okay. Um, so, I mean, in a way, it's nice that we can put names in there, so I'm, I'm kind of tempted to leave this the way it is. On the other hand, I'm tempted not to do that at the same time. I like NAFE IDs. I really like using them. But all right, so we'll have the observer be the moon. And remember, the observer is the moon only because we're looking for a total planet-wide eclipse on the observer. But we're really looking for lunar eclipses, so the actual observer is the planet, not the moon. But, you know, the obscured thing is going to be the sun, and the obscure ring thing is going to be the planet. And I think we can very early on here uh, convert these to NAFIDs. I don't want to wait till we're later in the program to do this. Um... So observer, yeah, and I think I want to do this like right here. Oh, I can't actually do an assignment though because um, these things take pointers. So anyway, we're we're just going to say variables we will use spice double um, sun ID planet ID and oh I guess moon ID should have come first moon ID. Okay. And then all we need to do here is we uh, and we're gonna we're gonna freaking document this shit. Um, 
read arguments into variables. That's good enough for that. Convert um, sun, moon, planet names into NAFE IDs. So we're going to do that just right away here. Um, so three of these suckers. Um, so we're going to take the um, moon, give it the moon ID. And I guess we need to spice boolean for found. Um, what do I do? Yeah, spice boolean for found. And because we don't care about it, we're just going to use use one variable for the whole thing. Um, found is ignored. So we're making it clear that we're not actually going to use it. And actually, it would be easier just to copy this one. And the moon, the sun, the planet, and then we need to convert. I mean, it would sort of be nice... Uh, crap. Because it actually would be nice if... Um, oh, crap. Now I want to do some freaking checking. Oh, wow. That, that's totally not a C thing. Um, and there's not even a die command here, but there is a printf. Um, yep, this is, this is again really not what I wanted to do. Um, with error checking, so we we're going to add this just because I can't, apparently seem to convince myself not to do it. Okay, so this says if we don't find it, uh, we just, we stop the program right there and say we couldn't find the moon, which is actually a good thing, because there's really no point in continuing the program if, if we can't assign a NAFE ID to the moon. Here, sun not found. And if you don't find the sun, you are in pretty bad shape. Um, even on a cloudy day, you can see the sun. Maybe on an overcast day, you can't. Um, but okay. Okay, so that was way too much time in there. The params, we probably don't need to do that. Um, we do need to do this. Um, that I think is obvious enough we don't need to we don't need to document it. We're basically just getting all the kernels we need. Um, determine frames, I don't think we'll need that. Um, so what are we doing? We're saying So the big thing we're doing here is we're looking at yeah, and here's kind of the weird thing we're going to do, because um, the function that we want to change, the function that we're looking at has three constants in it. Et is a, is a variable, uh, but um, but if you want to look at, geom if you want to use the geometric finder, that function can only have one parameter, Et. So we're going to have to define a function inside of main, because it'll change each time, uh, depending on the parameters, uh, that is the function that we actually want to see whether it's equal to negative 1 or not. Um, and we can do this. This is not a problem. Um, but we need... You know, so defining geometry finder function via... It's always a good word. Via given arguments. Okay. And the geometry finder function has to be something that does something. Um, so I, I kind of forgot. I think it has to return a double, but you know what? That is something we can actually look at pretty easily. Uh, GFQ. Uh, no, no it doesn't. The geometry finder function takes a unit, takes an <laughs> ephemeris time, but it can be whatever the hell you want it to be, takes a timestamp or anything, and then it returns the value, but it returns it as a pointer, so we actually have to, um, we have to be a little bit careful here. Um, so, and the cool thing here is, um, the cool thing here is we could actually re reuse GFQ. 
We can define it more than once, provided that we are defining it in different sub-functions. Um, so I think I defined it twice here. I defined it once for this um, bc ry set function, and then a totally different one for this uh, bc between function. They're similar, but they're different. So this is we're defining a function inside a function, um, which is permitted, and it also means we don't have to worry about namespace collision. Uh, so let me just copy the signature right here. In fact, I'm going to copy the whole freaking... Um, and nested functions okay per GCC. Did you know that? I mean, I might have made it up, so you don't really know if I... Uh, let's see. Wait, GFQ. Wait. Okay, that's really ugly. I don't think that's what I meant to do. Yeah. Why the hell am I defining it that weird? GFUDs. Um. Void GFQ, avoid funds, spice double ET, spice double time. This is really, really, really inefficient. Double angle, expo equals elevation. Oh, uh, this is a GFQ function that apparently returns a uh, Boolean. Uh, not a, I don't know why it needs all this extra crap here. Um, I think that's the function that tells whether it's increasing or decreasing, uh, because when it's, or, or something. Um, because for, by it's it, for Booleans it's harder because it's true or false. For what we're doing, it's actually pretty good because we're using a, a constant value. So we can just copy this function here. Um, nope, nope, that's the wrong one. We can use the much simpler GFQ function, which just takes two freaking things. So this is the function we want to uh, define geo GFQ for Geometry Finder, and we don't need to re-document this. Okay, so the spice double is going to be ET. We're not going to end value. And so here's where we're going to be careful. We're going to be using the global variables, uh, moon ID, sun ID, planet ID here, um, and at the same time uh, creating it inside of a sub-function. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm pretty sure that if I've written vclib correctly, this is just a very simple function call here uh, to uh, to this sucker, if I can find it. min corner ellipse. Um, eclipse. et, that's the one variable we're sending in. Um, spice int st. Int, uh, so those are just going to be the sun id, the... That's the sun, the planet ID, and the observer for us is the moon ID. Okay. So now we've done sort of this weird function that actually depends on global variables, but it's okay, because the GFQ itself uh, only depends on one, has only two, has only one actual parameter. The other is just an output value. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So now, I'm pretty sure that in order to use GFQ, we have to use a, um, well, let's go ahead and look at it. We're going to need a function that tells whether GFQ is increasing or decreasing, but I'm pretty sure we can use a built-in function that'll do it for any uh, function. You give it a function as a parameter, and it'll tell you if the function is decreasing or increasing. If not, we can always write our own very simple um, de increase, decrease uh, function. So... Let's do that here in a second, and no one's really in chat, which is good. Scare me. Okay, so now let's go ahead and use one of the geometry finder functions. Not, shouldn't be very difficult. Geometry finder, there's a whole bunch of these suckers. Um, and we don't want to set, well, we may at some point, oh. Um, these are all, G oh, because they're just abbreviated as GF. So GF, um, geometric event finder. There's a whole bunch of these that'll actually work. And I think the most generic one is, oh, angular separation search. But I bet you that requires a, um, a fixed value for the, the, um, n the, the, s the angular value. The ref value has to be a, a number, uh, reference value. And it's going to be, you can't make it like the sum of the two angular radiuses, which if we could, it'd be kind of cool. 
Um, and we could also consider the uh, minimum separation value at these two points. The minimum of the minimum. But I'm pretty sure that the okay. Yeah, it has to be double precision. It can't it's not something we can change as we go along, which we are doing here because we are looking at planets whose positions change. Um and thus their angular radii change. And I think we need the most generic uh one, which is geometric event finder, uh which will just be for included for any function. Um Yep, and I'm pretty sure I've used this before, so I'm going to cheat and, and look at the way I've used it before. And if not this, it's something very similar to this. Um, GF event, uh, sep. Oh, is that, am I using? Okay, I'm going to look to see if I've used a simpler function, but basically, um, we're going to be using, like, Something very similar to this, except instead of look, looking for the min, we're going to look to make sure that it's less than or greater than a given value. And let's see if I can... Yeah, is decreasing... Uh, let's see... Zero, 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 zero. Okay, that might not be it, actually. And I think that some of this might be in bclib.h. Um, yeah, because these aren't geometric event finders is the problem. Okay. And actually, I think bclib has a couple of examples of these that work that actually work pretty well. So, for this functional version, angles are radians of da 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 da. So we're using the spice da 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 da, gfq, gfdrx. That's the decrease function. Um, okay, uh, gfud c, and I think it is either that one or a very similar one. Um, that is the generic one that we need here. So let's see, GFSEP. User-defined uh, scalar. Yes. Um, kind of curious as to what this does now because uh, this seems to be even more generic. But let's see. Specific geometric quantity satisfies a spe specified mathematical condition. Uh, name of the routine that computes... Okay, so in this case, I guess, that you can even control your time step. Um, and the type of geometric... So this is actually even more general, but it's too general for us. We want GFUDs. GFUDs is sort of the standard, uh, the standard thing we want to do here. Okay. So over here, we're going to say GFUDs C. And the GFQ is the function. I'm pretty sure you can use gfuds G with, um, the second doesn't actually have to be a real function. It can be a, a function that calls functions. And that is um, one of these suckers, basically. So the, the first input is a function. And the second input is a function that takes a function, I think. It's really, really nasty. Um, but we can quickly look for all the instances of gfuds, and I'm sure there's at least one point where I use it in the sort of um, the silly way. GF uh, is decreasing. Oh. I didn't know I had an is decreasing function. GF decrors. Uh, trivial function. GF decrors. Uh, is. What the hell is is decreasing? Oh, is is decreasing just a function that I define each time? I'll need to look at that. Um. And I could have sworn that there's a way to do this without having to, to create your own GF dex function. And we're going to take a look at that now. Um, because they actually supply something that kind of does this for you. Um, functions that determines whether GFQ is... So it's a good definition of it. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, G fuds. Uh, huh. Oh, you know what is decreasing might actually be a function that takes any function of this nature 
and does this magic to it. So I might have already defined that in BC lib. Let's take a quick look here. Um, is decreasing, yeah, here it is. Yep. So is decreasing is a function that takes any other function that takes uh, two values. It well, actually takes one value and returns one value and then returns whether it's decreasing or not. And that is, um, so that is just something I can use generically. So I've already done that work. So this will tell whether, okay, so name the routine that computes whether the scalar con con quantity is decreasing. And all this does, by the way, is it just looks at the uh, value one second before and after the given ET and just d you know, determines which one is bigger. So it's not, not very difficult. Is decreasing. And then the next thing here is what is what are we looking for? For us, we're looking for when there's a solar uh, when there's a total eclipse over the whole planet. I mean, we're looking for next that less than, and I'm pretty sure the the next value is going to be the ref val, which is minus one for us. Um, the val after that is going to be. We don't need to do an adjustment at the end here. And step size. Mm -hmm. Um, because we're looking at uh, Jovian moons, this really, the step size can be pretty big. Um, because the step size has to be basically th the intervals where the function can't change from being one direction to the other direction back to being the first direction. Um, so it can, it can be fairly big. This could be like four or five days here for, for Jupiter. Um, I'm going to be, oh, I'm going to be painfully painful and make it one second for right now and that's gonna that's gonna be painful um, works so this is going to say how many how many uh, windows we allow inside of it inside and I think that we can do with just a macro here I think we just uh, max win um, so if we run it for more than 10,000 times you know four days or whatever this this will break but it's not really a huge deal and then the window is Oh, the conf yeah, we need to create a con uh, we need to create a window here, a CN fine window. That is the um, that's the uh, where we're going to be looking for whether or not this you know the, like the time interval basically, and the result is the an array of results. They don't call it an array, but it is an array. So we'll do this, uh, and we do need to define CN fine before we can do this uh, result. And this is the main. This is really what does all the work for us here. This is where it determines whether or not um, th whether or not uh, the whole planet's eclipsed and when exactly when. So this should let us figure out exactly when there's a total eclipse of the moon beginning and end, uh, right down to the very minute, maybe the second, but we are making assumptions that everything is spherical. So that may not be quite that good. And let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and create our CN fine window. And we're not treating the observer as a single point, so let's go ahead and okay. So da, 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 um, probably do this up here. Uh, start and end times for window. Uh, and I think I think we can be clever here, as I always say, and I always regret, and just say ear to uh, ets here and ear to et ear, because I do have those functions already written. Okay, so we've created our window. We've created our defining geometry, the thing that we're looking, the value we're looking for. We want it to be less than minus one. Right here at this point in the program, we've really done all of the hard work. The only thing we haven't done at this point um, is to actually print out the results, and that's literally the only thing we haven't done. Um, so I think, because we have all this stuff put somewhere else, we can skip all the way down to where we loop through the results. Um, okay. So, kind of would be nice to know what nres is. Um, okay, hang on. Yep, that would be that would be really useful to know what nres is. I think that it's the number of results. The, the question is, how do we get it? Um, and I'm sure that, yeah, there it is. Um, so, right, so after we actually make the search, we can, you say, um, how big is the result? And do we need to put bag and end? I guess we do, because we're going to be using them below. Um, 
and I think we can just put those up here in our um, in our, our initial declarations. We don't need to declare them just as we use them, even though there's an open question of whether this is a good idea or not. Okay, so then we do this. We don't need to print this. We don't need to print this, this, this. Um, there's a lot of stuff we don't need to print. Um, okay. All we really need to print is the beginning in... Okay, good. Very nice. Love it. Beautiful. Okay, I think this is all we really need to print. And... Now, now one thing we might actually want to print here is... Um, the reason we might want to print the, the parameters we're given is because we may run this program several times with different values and it is actually uh, useful to be able to distinguish those runs. So I forget which order we... I'm going to try to keep this consistent here. Yeah, Moon, Sun, Planet. And I guess I'm capitalizing both letters of ID. Okay. And that's really it. I mean, uh, that's really it. That's really the whole program. Um, this is the end of the for loop. And this is the end of... Uh, oops, 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 oops. I probably need to finish off... Kill off my error categories, huh? Yep. So that's not good. All right. Um, so that's the end of the for loop. And this should be the end of the, the function, the, the main function. Um, and we don't need this anymore. We don't need this anymore. So we have about 78 lines, roughly speaking, which we could probably... Let's actually trim this down. And if we don't count the comment lines, well, let's even be a little bit more tight here. Um, yeah, we don't want to kill it too much, though. We don't need variables, convert, they are checking. So we've got up like 68 lines here. It's not really that, that, that bad. So, all right, let's see if we can make this into, you know, if this will... It won't. I mean, there's going to be something wrong with it. Passing item into a VODs from incompatible pointer type... Um, okay. I think I once again made moon ID a double where I meant to make it a, um, what the hell are you doing? Come on, Emacs, behave. There we go. And these, of course, are going to be, the first, th these IDs are going to be int and big and double, going to be spice doubles. So... I'm so happy we live in a world where you can recompile until things work. Uh, BC occultations going through nicely. Now, it, they're going to use... Well, you know what? I forget how to do it, so let's rehash. BC occultations. I don't know how to use it. Okay. The moon will be Io, which is 501. The sun is 10. The planet is Jupiter. The cat food is Fancy Feast. Okay. And probably, again, we should have um, gotten rid of that. In fact, let's go back to vclib now. I'm going to do a quick save into git, which you won't be able to see. But then I'm going to remove the, uh, the printf lines from most of vclib, uh, because those were just there for debugging, and now they're just bugging us instead of debugging for us. See what I did there? I am so freaking clever. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and see where the printfs are. Some of them might actually be... Um, that's sprintf, that's allowed. Let's uh, comment it out. Number of results. What function are we in here? EC between. I think we can just comment that out. Oh, so most of them are already commented out. That was just one. And because changing BC lib won't recompile, I have to make a little minor change a forced change, as it were, uh, to BC occultations. Okay, works nicely. 10, 9, 8. Who do we uh, deviate? Okay, so here we're saying that the one second time is actually insanely too small. I'm going to increase it to 60. I'm try I, I try to be careful with these numbers uh, just because... Um, let's see, max 60. Just because if you make them too big, you can skip uh, an occultation. Although, really given the normalcy of how often this happens, 
this shouldn't even be an issue. Um, we, we sh I should be able to put this at a much, much higher number and still get results. So let's give this another five seconds. Two, three, four, forget it. All right, let's go ahead and put this up in an hour now. And again, I could probably make it even higher than that, and it's not an issue because Jupiter's moons just don't orbit that fast. Even Metis, the innermost, doesn't orbit that fast. Um, so now, there we go. That was pretty damn quick. Okay. Um, this would be a lot more exciting if we could check these results without bringing up Stellarium. Um, so let me go ahead and... Um, Let's go ahead and do this for our moon, in fact. So let's say that it is, um, uh, th the thing being obscured is our moon, which is 301. The sun is the thing being obscured, and the thing that is doing the obscuring is us, the planet Earth. And this should give us very accurate lunar eclipse, total lunar eclipse start and end times. So let's see when, for last year. Um, you know what? I'm getting kind of sick and tired of last year. Let's just do this for this year, for next, the upcoming year. That wasn't helpful. Let's do it for the, these two years. I think there's one coming up, like, at the very end of December. Maybe it's happening right now. Okay. So this one presumably begins January. I'm bored with January. That happened a long time ago. July. Screw you. We're going to do it in the future. Okay, here we go. So supposedly in, hope this better be 2021, otherwise we've got a problem. Okay, lunar eclipses for 2021. And let's see if you, 20, May 26th, let's take a look at that one. Um, a total lunar eclipse on May 26th, real good stuff. Um, oh, wow, it'll be the first one since January 2019, so there, re there, re there, re there really are no full total lunar eclipses in 2020. That's nice. Totality, partiality, penumbral, and so what we're predicting is the, the full eclipse begins at 10.41 a.m. GMT, with a slight variance because we're using spheres for the Earth. The moon and the sun are spheres, so that's fine. And does this tell us when the, um, I guess we might as well compute the end time of the that eclipse as well. Which is 11.43, so we would say the, the middle point would be like 11.11 .11 or something. 11.19, that's good. Um, I'm trying to see if this thing has any more, no it doesn't. Um, trying to find when totality is supposed to begin and end. Um, it'll be visible in here. It'll be visible anywhere the moon's visible because the moon itself is the thing that gets dark. And I think this might have the times that we need. Um, and I am... Oh, cool. We'll have an eclipse. Nice. Um, sorrows, half sorrow cycle. Um... Cycle 121, come on. Give us something on this eclipse that tells me I'm right. Um, yeah, this is the annual solar eclipse, which would be kind of, uh, kind of cool. It won't be visible where I am, so screw it. Uh, May 26 is the one we're looking for. Um, and it's not listed here, nice. Okay. Time and date, I think. I need to put an ad blocker in here, but... Um, November 18th through... Oh, so we're looking at the one, sorry, that's in May. And it's in 2021, so... There it is. And... 519 days. Let's count that down. Um... And we're getting a pretty good idea that the middle of the eclipse occurs when I say it will occur. Um, is the eclipse visible in Albuquerque? Well, apparently, yes, it is. 
Um, full eclipse begins at 11, 11, 26. I say it begins at, oh, not even close. So that's not good at all. That's, that's pretty bad. Full eclipse begins, full eclipse ends at 11, 20, really? It's only 14 minutes. Um, 11.25, and I said it's 11.43. So, um, clearly, I am wrong. Um, and my times are naturally, so my time of 10.41 doesn't correspond to anything, and my end time of 11.43 doesn't correspond to anything. So, what am I doing wrong? Well, now we get to bring up Stellarium. Uh, we've, we've missed our good friend Stellarium, and we get to bring him up now. And we will view this from the Earth, just, just a, as the beginning. And yay, here we are on Earth. Um, and we're probably, well, we, we actually have the setup, so there's no horizon and there's no, um, and there's no ground. So we'll be able to see it even if it's not visible, technically, from where we are. Um, 2021, 05, whoa, just 5. I think it's the 26, but I mean, at this point, we can just kind of check. And I think we said 20, 5, 26. Um, also, we just make sure to put as much crap as we can there. 1041 on May 26th at GMT. Um, so let's just keep an eye on the sun. I don't know why we're keeping an eye on the sun, because this is a lunar eclipse. Keep an eye on the moon. And is the moon... Oh, wow. 21.39, so that suggests the moon is in Pluto. Also, it suggests that ever since they added all these additional things to, um, to Stellarium, it's harder to find what you actually want. In this case, the freaking moon. Okay. Da, 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 da. Time passes. Um, nothing. Okay, here we go. Here we go. The moment the ecliptic touches that, it, we should start to see because that's the antipath of the sun, and we are seeing just nothing. Absolutely smurfly nothing. Um. Oh, oh, oh wait! With the ecliptic sun in reverse and come back the other way. Okay, so that's fine. That's just the start of the eclipse. So now we're getting more and more eclipsed. Okay, so now we have near complete eclipse. It's 1056, and I said it should have started at 1041. So clearly I've done something wrong. Um, let's in fact go back 15 minutes in time, and if you really wanted to, I could do this with, um, the correct way, which is using the time setter. Okay. So at 1041, when I say the entire moon is eclipsed, I'm wondering if it's this point and this point that are eclipsed, uh, so I'm not getting the, the, um, the full eclipse that I that I need. Um, and uh, maybe my thinking was incorrect in terms of what needs to be eclipsed. Because um, clearly we have two opposite points here that are being eclipsed. The direction the sun is coming from is um, kind of straight on, actually, from behind us because it is lunar eclipse. Um, let's go to the moon and see what this looks like from there, although I don't think that's going to give us much... Uh, much help of what we need. Hopefully the listing moon is M-O-O-N, not as uh, Luna, which is its other proper name. Okay, so here we are on Luna. Let's find the sun here. Now this is where we need to be looking at the sun from. And the sun, okay, is in fact totally, mm, totally eclipsed? Yes, totally eclipsed from here, but now, Let's go to the middle of the moon. 
we can kind of keep an eye on this here. So to know it's okay, so over here, still eclipsed over here, over. Aha! So that's the problem. The northernmost portion of the moon is not seeing an eclipse at this time. Um, so the point, so I guess, you know, I guess we can look at the four corner points then, maybe even more. Um, so the point where the sun is overhead, the subsolar point, um, let's see, the subsolar point, we, we can find it where the azimuth is going to be 90. So the, uh, the altitude rather is 90. So the altitude here is 83, 80, 78, 83. Um, hour angle is, oh, the hour angle is actually really close to zero, which is good. Okay. Now there has to be a subsolar point here somewhere. Okay, so the, the, I guess the problem is here that I, I checked the subsolar point and I checked this point and this point and I guess the umbral cone so I'm not really seeing what I'm doing wrong here based on um, the diagram that I can't bring up right now. Okay. Based on this diagram, uh, it seems like if you look at the sun, take any vector perpendicular to it, um, you should be, if, and if the, there's an eclipse on those two perpendicular vectors, um, y there should be the umbral cone should be touching this point and this point, and we should have a total eclipse. Um, but apparently, whatever's going on here, um, the umbral cone is somehow touching this and this, but doesn't eclipse a portion of this. And that may be that I'm finally uh, reaching the boundaries of attempting to uh, estimate a, a, spheroi a spheroid uh, with, a, uh, with a circle. Uh, so that could be the issue here. Um, so maybe we need to go back to the drawing board here. I'm actually not too unhappy with the results, despite the fact that they're wrong. Um, let's take a look at how well it does predicting the other eclipse that we had uh, kind of uh, glossed over earlier. Um, and in this case, we're going to use um, we're going to use the same site to see what it begins and ends, but. Uh, so this is uh, 19th, and this one says it's going to last like an hour and three minutes. Uh, and the Stellarium is a sort of a hog in terms of memory, so we are going to go ahead and kill it. As soon as we kill this window. Goodbye, fair Stellarium, I knew you well. Okay. And by the way, the actual expression is, I knew you Horatio. I if you're quoting the Shakespeare thing, it's not, I knew you well. But it's the same general meaning, that is, sort of a very lax attitude to uh, seeing Horatio's dead body. Wasn't that a nice thing to say? All right, let's see if we can go back over here. Uh, da 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 da. So I'm actually a little bit excited about getting into three-dimensional stuff more because, um, I mean, I've kind of believed the two-dimensional stuff wasn't going to be accurate to begin with. So this is the November 18th, 19th eclipse. Uh, let's see when this is. Uh, oh, it's partial. Oh. And see, this is really bad, because I'm claiming that there's a, there's a phase of totality here uh, where the whole moon is obscured. And clearly that is not the case. Um, so my, my, and I'm thinking that maybe I need to use the vector, the basis vectors, not just plus and minus, but also in the, in the four corneral, corneral directions. Uh, the entire, you know, the entire sort of quasi-equator that's created uh, by, the, by the exact points where the sun is setting all p or rising. Or, you know, kind of doing neither. Okay. Um, maximum eclipse is at 9.02. So, again, it is kind of between the two times that I give it, but it's not, it's not, even, a, um, it's not even a total eclipse. Um, so, not cool. Okay, so I have failed in a way in my mission, but... Um, I have learned something, and I guess what I've learned is 
my vision of the umbral cone is probably incorrect because it is in two dimensions. Um, so I'll probably need to project it into three dimensions. Uh, and I don't even know if you can draw a cone with, uh, you can draw you can draw polyhedrons with mathics, uh, you know, which is arbitrarily as good as a cone. I don't know if you can do transparency with mathics like you can with Mathematica, because it would be nice to have sort of a transparent, translucent sort of cone uh, so we could actually see what's, you know, what's beneath it, what's going on, and how I made this mistake uh, that looks like it should be correct. So let me take a quick look to see how long I've been streaming. I've been streaming for about an hour and 20 minutes, which is usually the max. Uh, let me quickly see if there's anything in README stream that I kind of want to do uh, before we take off for the day. So we, we can't answer the question that we wanted to answer because we can't compute lunar... Uh, we can't connect compute lunar eclipses correctly. Um, so we are using the alternate approach. Um, the curve for sunrise to sunset, and then we're going to need to do something more. We're going to need a two-dimensional search here. Um, to the population answer, I wanted to add a the webinar link, but that's not really important. Uh, this is part of the other question, table error I.O. Um, table error for I.O. disappears doesn't reappear very yeah and I think we looked at the table that gave the uh, the correct results and it showed that IO disappears for six months doesn't happen bugged okay uh, ignoring your problems always a good thing um, but I think that's just a message for us so we, we're, we're okay with not doing that anymore um, and the other question of course was the parallax how small of an error is it can we just get rid of it uh, testing from you know Metis IO Ganymede Callisto um, and Calypso is never eclipsed because, and we do want to kind of show that, the image of where from Callisto the sun always, Jupiter always passes to the, what we would call the north of the sun. Um, and then we wanted to look at possibly eclipsing moons of each other. Um, Metis, 90 degree vector approach, which is the one I'm using now that didn't work. Um, and I think Meta Exchange we came to the ultimate decision that it is not a good idea to post live streams, but it is okay to post recordings of live streams because people can fast forward and back forward through those, or I guess that's called reversing if you want to be specific uh, through those. Whereas with the uh, live stream, not only can't you go forward because that would violate the temporal prime directive and you'd be in the future, you can't even go backwards because I don't think Twitch lets you, uh, if you can go back right up to a minute for clipping, but I don't think you can go back beyond that unless you go to this really weird hacky site that lets you do it. Um, so that's not even that useful. So this answer has been given as no, and I accept it as no. Um, so the term, oh, and this is part of the other thing I wanted to look at, which was, uh, there, there's several questions about uh, when is the sun at various ecliptic longitudes, uh, multiples of five degrees. There are calendars that are based on this, and those are important. And by the way, uh, create, looking at some of those other calendars might also be interesting. Um, then there's always horizons, which we want to mention as a possible answer. Um, and again, the easy answer here was because if you if if I was being eclipsed by Jupiter, it's eclipsed everywhere in the universe. Um, and I think we answered this one already. Uh, Umbral cone, compute Jovian. All right. Um, and I guess what I'll add to the list of not future streams is my calendar project. Um, multi-calendar project, which shows you the uh, the uh, date in various different calendar systems. Um, okay, so now um, this is a pause for station disidentification. Blah. Um, let's see if we can get some of our uh, spherical stuff going again. And I don't know how much longer I, I want to stream for, but let's see if we can get some of the spherical stuff going again. I think we discovered we were unhappy with it because uh, there's a lot of limitations in terms of, of we can't draw different colors, we can't have different lighting sources uh, unless we can, um, and, and stuff like that. So we weren't tremendously happy with that. Uh, but it still might help us in terms of, of seeing what the umbral cone looks like. Um, and so let's go ahead and do that. We unfortunately probably can't do it with accurate positions for the sun, moon, and, and earth because 
those are very, very far apart, actually. And um, I mean, even on scale, the distance between the sun and the and if we if we make the radius just to scale, it's ridiculous. So that won't work. But let's go ahead and see if we can uh, we can mess a little bit with. Uh, let me go ahead and push the stuff to get real quick. Um, Let's see if we can mess with that a little bit here from uh, from what we had before. And I think we did have something uh, that we, we did have some three-dimensional stuff going on. Uh, VC Eclipse diagrams, was it? And I'm almost sure that's not correct because these diagrams are, um, yes, these di diagrams are two-dimensional. And we have now sort of decided that's not going to work. VC Eclipse mechanics? Um, no. And I think it's BC Eclipse Portions is what we actually need. Um, and it's not. Is it Playground? And if it is, we need to kind of move it out of there. OK. And it might have been Playground, actually. Um, yeah, it is Playground. All right. So we need to move this to something else. We're going to call it BC Eclipse 3D Mathix. Okay, and we're going to steal some stuff from it. Um, yeah, we're going to steal these kind of. Um, I, these are the actual coordinates; they don't just don't work. So we're going to we're going to we're going to steal these sort of artificial coordinates here. And what am I looking at here? Oh yeah. Oh shoot, got stuff to do in real life. I'm not going to do it, but just just so you know. I am not doing real life stuff for your benefit. And if you believe that, y you're wrong. Okay. So I think all of this we can copy over. Uh, and the rest of this we are, um, yeah, I think we wanted to kind of comment all that out. These are just like, uh, this, this was just some playing around with linear model fit to see if we could, that would be for the weather project. Uh, that is in my README projects, but is not. Uh, we've not talked about it yet. Um, but this should be what we're looking for in terms of of spheres. So we just need to say BC Eclipse. Um, what's interesting here is I think that even though I've frozen the machine and unfrozen it, stuff running on local. Well, I didn't even have to say that, did I? Stuff running on local ports is still going to work. Okay. Um, so here we have. I don't know what the hell we have here. These lines don't help. Um, I wonder if we can label stuff in 3D. Uh, anyway, so these are... Mm, yeah, so this is going to be... Uh, oh, right, right, this is the sun, this is the earth, this is the moon. Um, and so now... So I don't even know if you can do cones with mathix. Uh, but you can do polyhedrons. And this is the center line. And we want kind of something that goes from there to there, there to there, but also kind of as a circle. So we want like a circle here, a circle here. And remember, there's no such thing as circles in, in um, three dimensions. And I mean, I, I wonder if it will allow us to draw circles. I wonder if it allows us to draw two-dimensional objects in three dimensions. Um, yeah, let's find out, I guess. Um, and I, I strongly suspect this will not work. But hey, you never know until you try, unless you read the directions, which is boring. Yep, does not like the fact that I'm trying to put a circle into a 3D a container. I wonder if there's something called a circle 3D. Th I'm going to look at the instructions in just a second. I'm almost sure this isn't going to work either, because circles are not really three-dimensional. OK, um, so let's go over here. Let's go ahead and close some of our tabs up. Um, and now let's look for graphics. I guess we have a, 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 a PDF of it, so we can, uh, we can kind of look at that. By kind of meaning we will look at that. In fact, we probably just need to do this. 
Now, if this works correctly, it should bring this up in Firefox. Nice, in Firefox. All right, now we can look in graphics instead of in events, which is what I would normally use. Okay, uh, graphics using graphics 3D list of primitives. Uh, so far, polygon, line, point. Um, and we know spheres su supported, but you're not going to tell us that, are you? Piece of crap. Maybe I need to find, uh, this is the 1.0 documentation, but I think it's the latest documentation. Um, Plot 3D. Does Plot 3D help us? Ooh, maybe, actually. Um, Oh good, see so here it tells us basically that it doesn't support spheres, but now it does. Sphere 3D box. Nicely undocumented. Interestingly, their attempt to create a sphere fails. Um, although it works here, but another attempt fails. Collection of spheres of radius are centered at the points. Um, I don't know how that's useful to anyone, but okay. Well, I mean, a lot of these functions are not implemented, so uh, graphics 3D primitives. Um, and I'll honestly admit, with you know, you don't have, you don't even have to admit it because you can obviously tell it's true. I don't really know that much about 3D graphics myself, or in fact, I'm not really comfortable in three dimensions. I live in Flatland. Um, so I guess what we want is like a circle here getting tinier, but how do we draw a circle? We could draw a circle as a cylinder if they allowed that, if they have cylinders. Um, if they don't have cylinders, what's the closest thing we can get to drawing a, um, a circle? I guess we could draw a, uh, a skinny polygon or something. Um, but let's take a look here. Mm. A cuboid is, I think, what we would call a cube. Graphics 3D box, I think we decided. Line 3D box, what is that? Probably, yep. Not really well defined. So, um, I guess we could draw squares from where we want to, um, to make up our little pseudo cone and then increase the number of edges in the square uh, until we hit, uh, you know, something that looks pretty much like a circle. Um, but this looks really ugly and I'm not sure that I want to deal with it. Um, graphics 3D, sphere, and da 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 We don't even necessarily need the lines here, we just need the um, in the angular conal point, which would be umbral point, which is, yeah, that's just weird. Um, I mean, would it be a polygon that goes, starts somewhere, goes up like the, okay, okay, so that's two of its things can be these lines, that, that, that's not bad, okay, so we can have, um, I still don't know why we have a frickin' line going from the moon to the, like, what appears to be the middle of nowhere. Um, oh, unless that's the border of the umbral cone. Okay. Um, okay, okay. So we have this line, the other side of this line. Um, and we can extend those out. Uh, well, actually, we don't need to. Um, extend this line, this line. Um... We're still only in two dimensions if we do that, and we connect the two lines, we're still only in, in two dimensions um, because three points form a plane. But when we get here, can we, can we do something interesting uh, from there? And um, so let's say I just want to draw a plane cone and don't even worry about this diagram. Uh, start from here, go up here, and then draw points along here, and then come back. That doesn't seem right, though. 
Um, I guess I'd have to go from here to here, 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 here. Um, and that that is doable. I mean, there's no reason I couldn't do that. Um, and then we could modify that cone to be any cone we wanted to. Um, but that just seems freaking strange. I'm just wondering if there's a better way to do it. Um, well, let's try it. Let's see if we can build a little tiny cone here that is not this, um, not this one, obviously. Cone set equal to graphics 3D, start of list, end of list, semicolon, and I don't want axes this time. So we'll start the cone at, um, can we do points? I guess we're going to find out. Let's see if the, even that works. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, we can do points, even though it's not documented. Always a fun thing to do. And I guess we can go up to, um, from here, we can do polyhedron. Is the, they call it polyhedron or polygon? Um... I'm going to be annoyed if it turns out that you can't act, that's not actually an implemented feature to do polyhedrons yet. Whoa. Sphere. Polygon, okay, so... Uh, is a polygon the same thing as a polyhedron? I think it is. Okay, so we want polygon. And do polygons have to have... Okay, I guess this one is going to have three sides. Um, so the, the, we won't need the point when we're done, of course. We're going to go from here up to... Um, hmm. I guess we can go to um, height of one and then do this and then go to one further point which would be like cosine of 10 degrees sine of 10 degrees um, and return to base this should give us like a like a sliver of a cone and by should I mean won't but let's see what this does and if it this does I think I, I can get a handle on it not boxes yet yeah, it's not uh, Polygon. Oh, actually, I might need to do this for polygon. It's like I'm building up Mathematica from Mathix. Whoa! Really doesn't like that. Um, these should be... Unless... I have to put an N in front of these because it doesn't like unevaluated forms. Lots of fun. And again, it's quite possible it just doesn't want to do it. Okay, that's vaguely interesting. Um, doesn't actually show what I wanted to show, though. Uh, zero, zero, one, one, let's go to 60 degrees, I guess. So this should go, um, you know, up to the right, draw a little bit of a circle, and then come back down again. So let's see if this does that. I'm not seeing it. Um, unless polygons don't need to be closed, and I'm, I'm closing them by mistake. Uh, apparently they do not need to be closed. They, they're self-closing. Uh, or whatever something. Words. Okay, let's see what this does. Hey, that does not look too good. Um, but we might be able to do something with it. So... So do we want to go up, make a circle, 
come back down? I don't think that's correct. Um, because we really want to be coming down at each, we want to be making each sort of slice of the cone. So there's this. This is one slice. And um, I don't also I don't want to draw the slices separate. Well, actually, it might be kind of cute to draw the slices separately. So the next slice might be going from this point. Um, To this point, and obviously we're going to automate all of this if this actually works. Um, sorry, cosine of 120 degrees, and then we'll try to put it together into a single cone. God help us. Um, maybe a comma here. So this might give us two little pieces of, a, of what we would hopefully is a cone. Yeah, I'm not getting a very coney feeling out of this, to be honest. Um, although I guess I could get a more of a coney. Oh, shiny! Um, yeah, obviously this is a very ugly looking cone because we're only looking at um, we're only looking at very small chunks of the cone. Uh, we're looking at very large sort of approximations with the cone. So let's go ahead and create a um, temporary 1743 because it is 1743 in Albuquerque. Um, and I, I'm not sure I want to live on GMT yet. I'm kind of melded. So that's pretty cool. Okay. So our table is going to be um, starting at 0, 0, 0. All of them start at the same point. 1, the cosine of n degrees, then the sine of n degrees, and we will go ahead and floofify them. Uh, let's see. And we don't need to go back here, so this is going to be this, this, why, oh, because it's a numerical, Duh. nope, hang on, 1 comma n, yep, there's an n there. Uh, N goes from 0 to 360 in chunks of 10. See what that does. And then it's unlikely it's going to work on the first try, but we might as well put it in here. And I think we're actually one, we're nested one level too deep even for this, but let's see what this does. Yeah, it doesn't like it. Um, all right, so now we're going to load this in actual Mathix. Hey. Oh, yeah, I forgot we're still running something here. Um, and you know what? Let's not do it here. Let's do it here. Um, 3D Mathix. Dun, dun, dun. T1743. Um, yes, and I think one problem, of course, is we have not made these into polygons. These are just uh, thingies. So we actually want polygon. These are just lists, actually, right now. Polygon of this sucker. Um, still is not going to work, I think, because I'm, I'm, I'm nesting one level too deep. In other words, my list needs to be flattened slightly. Uh-oh. It's thinking. Am I in danger? Uh, I probably don't need that point in front of it either, but let's see. Well, it's not drawing anything, but at the same time, it's not complaining. Let's go ahead and bring it up in regular mathics while we try to figure out what, what it's thinking about. 17. I don't know why T1 is defined. What is T1? Oh. Why is T1 that? Oh, that might have been defined somewhere else, actually. Mm. Okay. So we have polygon, polygon. So we actually need to flatten that by 1. 
And mm, I think we just flatten that. Um, okay, so we might be able to get away with this. Uh, graphics 3D. Um, T1743. And if that works, it should actually just print itself out to the, uh, to the... Okay, think, think, think. Okay, that should have worked. Um... Graphics 3D. So is each of these a polygon of three elements? Um, no, it is not. Oh, I think because in each case we need to go to the next point before moving on. Yep, so this actually has to be... Yeah, I, I was being a little bit too lazy here. We actually have to complete the... We actually have to go to the next little piece of the polygon here. So it's one... So that's one point, that's two points... The third point, <coughs> let's do this. The third point is going to be 1n cosine n plus 10 degrees to finish this off. Uh, and then n sine of, we need to go on the next point onto the circle. So this, this, n sine of n plus 10 degrees and why am I missing a point? Oh, I need to close off my ends n, n, n. So that, those should be our three points for the polygon. It probably won't work, but that that was kind of a well, damn! It's Madonna! TOS! Okay. Um, that's not a bad looking cone there. It's Mount Fuji! Okay, let's see. It's Mount Fuji! Oh, come on. Now it's not doing what I want. It's Madonna! It's a party hat! That's not bad. We got a cone going here. That's actually kind of nice. Um, the next question is whether we can do transparency, and I'm going to bet you we can't. Uh, and of course the other question is, can we draw this cone... Um, first of all, can we draw it as a single polygon instead of um, drawing it as multiple polygons? Uh, so let's write these down. Um, and actually we can write it down here. Draw as single polygon instead of multiples. Um, reposition cone for arbitrary uh, umbral point, well, we'll call it just the point and angle. And then um, make it translucent, which is the fancy way of saying not transparent. Um, and there is a temptation here to use 3.js. Um, which also, which doesn't do as much math, but it does kind of do a good job of of displaying things. Um, that is one nice looking tit. Yes, I said tit. I think we can get away with that. Okay, and now it is really time to end the stream, because I say it is. Um, thank you for watching, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. I don't know, just thank you for watching. Goodbye.